Hi, my name's Dave Adams. Welcome to The Core Mechanic. And today we're doing a tech talk on metagame, ortho games, and para games. Let's get to it. Hi, my name's Dave Adams, and I love playing games. At the 2015 PAX convention, one of my favorite game designers, Mike Selinka, presented his list of top 100 games you must absolutely, positively know how to play. The 100th game on the list was a challenge to play a game of my own design. With a desire to understand more about the hobby that I love so much, I've taken on that challenge to design a game. But first, I need to learn as much as I can about game design. I'm going to start by playing as many of the games on Mike's list as possible. Join me as I learn more about the core mechanic. Now, a while ago, we did a tech talk on heuristics. And during that discussion, we referred to heuristics as the post-game discussion. And there's a couple of things happening there. You've got activity happening in game that's informing discussion out of game, which then in turn informs activity within the game. And it's that interplay today that we want to look at. That idea of metagame, ortho games, and para games, and how they interact, and how we define those terms. So let's get started by having a look at some different authors and their definitions. Prominent game designer Andrew Garfield in his book The Characteristics of Games defines metagame as being the activities connected with playing the game that aren't actually playing the game itself. There's a really restricted use of this term that comes across in uh, competitive card games or collectible card games, CCGs for short. Such games like Magic the Gathering, which was also an invention of Andrew Garfield, giving him some credibility when talking about this topic, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! all talk about the metagame, but in, in a restrictive sense. In the restrictive sense, what they're trying to talk about is the post-game uh, preparation for competitive play. Oftentimes when we talked about metagame, before a match, we were talking about what are the dominant cards being used, what's popular within the, the, the sport right now, who's actually playing what, and we'd, we'd really be talking about deck construction. This restrictive sense of the term also led to perhaps a, a term which is a bit nonsensical when you look at the broader concept of metagaming, but in this restricted sense made sense, we talked about the anti-meta. And anti-meta was again to do with deck pre preparation. Sometimes you would build a deck or throw in splash cards, which were considered anti-meta. They were against the dominant state of play. So most people would be playing a particular form of deck, and you might play a deck which is specifically designed to counter that deck or to, or to break down its, its hold over the game. Garfield's definition is actually broader than that sense. That's a really restrictive way of using the term metagaming. In a broader sense, there really isn't the chance to be anti-meta because metagaming just has to do with any activity to do with the game that isn't playing the game itself. So preparing your deck is metagaming. Talking about cards is metagaming. Getting things, getting your deck ready, creating deck lists, tournament play is metagaming. We can also include in this the rewards of gaming. This might be either through competitive play, where we talk about winning rewards, such as monetary rewards, as they offer in Magic the Gathering. It could just be player status or ranking, or even just the status you feel from winning a game. And this doesn't have to just be competitive play only. When we talk about the metagame in, say, your average board gaming session with just your friends, we can talk about rewards in the sense of the status among your, your peers when you win the game or when you out-strategize your friends, but also the reward of having fun. That's a reward, and that's about the metagame. And the metagame can then also be in terms of discussing the game itself. In casual play, metagaming could be simply discussing how, to, how best to host a gaming session, or even which games to choose with which groups, or perhaps even choosing themes for different nights, such as Friday the 13th. Any of those discussions to do about game play that aren't actually about playing the game itself. It can also be those discussions which we talked about earlier that promote heuristics. Sitting down and talking about the strategies that people use, what's the best way to go into a game, how do you, what do you do mid-game, those things are also metagames. The concept of metagame is so broad that sometimes when talking about what is metagame and what's gaming, 
the lines between game and meta can be a bit blurred. So to help narrow that down, Garfield attempted to look at definitions of gaming. And the issue that he ran into was that the definitions varied so much and were so wide that the language wasn't really convenient for helping to describe metagames. So one word that he developed was ortho games. An ortho game is a game for two or more players with rules that result in the ranking of players or the weighting of players and is done for entertainment. Now, this means that players tend to be in direct competition. It's harder to talk about co-ops as being ortho games, simply because a lot of the time players aren't ranked and the game, the rules don't result in a weighting of players in terms of how the results finalise. It's either just the players win or the players lose, and often the players aren't in competition, usually competing against the board. So there is some leniency in that you could argue it could be an ortho game if you included the board as a player. If not, then it would technically not fit into the definition. What this excludes is games like Dungeons and Dragons and World of Warcraft, where players aren't necessarily in direct competition, and it's more about cooperative storytelling. The for entertainment part also excludes such things as military war games. To further clarify ortho games, Garfield offers characteristics of games, namely the agentile and the systemic properties. The systemic properties are those systems built into the game that assist with gameplay, and they will impact on how the game is played and in what manner it's played. Agentile properties comes from the word agent or people. In other words, it's how players impact the game and how they play. To give an example, let's look at the characteristic of time. Now, naturally, through the systems of the game of chess, chess will take longer than the game of tic-tac-toe. The systems of play just naturally result in chess being a much longer game and tic-tac-toe being a much quicker game. But there are also a gentle properties. So the agents or the people playing the game will impact the time it takes to play a game as well. So when we're talking about the characteristics of games, such as time and gameplay and those elements, we need to consider the systems and the agents, or us. These definitions further enable us to talk about metagaming in different ways. So if I'm now talking about a game of sushi dice and there are two teams competing against each other, at any given time, one member of my team will be versing another member of my opponent's team. I have the freedom at any time to yell chop if both players roll a specific side of the die. But that may also mean taking the turn away from my own team player, and if I want my team to win, there may not be any benefit for that. So what I'm doing is now looking at the systems of the game and how the game work, and I'm making a decision as an active player as to what systems I choose to utilise at any time for the purposes of bringing about an optimal result in the game. Garfield isn't the only person to try and define these terms. In their article Metagames, Paragames and Orthogames, A New Vocabulary, Carter, Gibbs and Harrop all have an attempt at trying to redefine these terms in, a, in an effort to try and come to a better understanding of gameplay in the way it is today. Now they begin by looking at a form of metagaming which they call higher strategy, which falls within the restrictive sense that Garfield talked about and which we discussed a little bit earlier. They talked about the Magic the Gathering and that pre-game preparation. They also talked about, in higher strategy, being things like StarCraft, where players might utilise certain strategies to put other players off or utilise knowledge of maps and knowledge of other players' gameplay to try and develop strategies to win. This could also include games like poker, which is a game that requires you to have a certain sense of the systems and the agents at play. In poker, you're not only following the systems of, well, I know that these cards have come out, they've got this percentage of getting what they want, but you're also looking at the player and the person and making decisions about them. And it's that sort of metagaming that Carter and Harrop and Gibbs include within their concept of higher strategy metagaming. The next concept of metagaming they discuss is metagaming as breaking the fourth wall. 
And this tends to be more about the RPGs or Dungeons and Dragons as an example. Now, what they try to define is the difference between what the player knows and what the character knows. If, as a player, I know that this particular GM likes to set traps, as a character, my character might be more cautious than what I would be with, say, a different GM. What I'm using or utilizing is my player knowledge, and I'm incorporating that into the game through my character. I also might have knowledge that a dragon lives in a certain castle or a certain mountain, but my player may not know that. Now the question is, do I play my character in the way of someone who doesn't know that information and send them off to the castle because that might be what they do? Or as a player knowing that information, do I try and find a reason to be more cautious or to find another task somewhere else? That sort of information becomes part of the metagame and that's breaking the fourth wall. The third element of metagaming that the authors identify is metagaming as something extra. That's when subcomponents can increase gameplay without actually adding anything to the game. This might be player rankings in, during campaign modes, it might be Xbox Live achievements, it might even just be the player having their own personal goals within the game. The reason Carter, Gibbs and Harrop spend time discussing these elements of the metagame is in an attempt to try and develop a new vocabulary. And they want to redefine some of the terms that Garfield offered, as well as offering up one term of their own. Now in terms of ortho gaming, they want ortho game to go more with the original Greek, meaning straight or correct. And so an ortho game becomes what players agree to be the straight or correct name for the game or elements of the game. Now the idea of this is to try and help with improving the definition of metagame. Again the authors try to consider Greek as part of the definition where meta means beyond or higher or uh, an abstraction or self-referential. They define the term then as player acts or considerations of resources that go beyond the control or scope of player, what players consider to be the ortho game. This becomes about the interaction between players both in-game and outside of the game. So players who are now part of the ortho game, they could be playing on their own or even playing online so long as they're not playing with any knowledge of the externals of the game. What this means is that the ortho game becomes part of an ongoing discussion between designers and players and the broader community about what is core to the game. This way players engage in metagaming because it makes them more successful at the goals of the game or the, even the implicit goals of the game such as rankings during missions. It also means that we can include such games as WoW and Dungeons and Dragons when we talk about the discussion between what is core or the ortho game and what is peripheral or where the players interact, which is the metagame. So we can still talk about those elements within D&D or WoW, whereas before, under Garfield's definition, we weren't, those terms weren't really suitable, or the, their definitions weren't suitable for including such games. The third term that Carter, Gibbs and Harrop offer us is paragame. Again, drawing from the Greek, they suggest that para being alongside or analogous to, but distinct from, they suggest that a para game should be defined as a game or elements of the game which are peripheral to and yet alongside the metagame. So the way this is distinct from the metagame is that it has more to do with the player intentions or the, the player's motivations. Or to use Garfield's terms, the, it's an agental uh, form of the game where it has to do with what the player desires to get out of the game. So this could include uh, statistic hunting or uh, achievement hunting. It could include such times as when I would take a Yu-Gi-Oh deck along to a tournament just to see if it was tournament worthy. Or it could just be about me trying to beat an opponent or trying to get as much out of the game as I want. It could just be I just want to have fun today. So that's my para game, or what I'm trying to do that's peripheral to, but alongside the game. Now by providing these definitions, Carter, Gibbs and Harrop offer us a, a broader perspective, which allows us to be more inclusive with the games that we choose, which means we can and choose D&D &D and we can choose WoW. And they also offer a chance for gamers to be part of defining the very hobby in which they're involved. It gives gamers the chance to be part of the dialogue and the discussion. And that's perhaps a good thing. But they run into problems. 
and there are issues. The main problem we run into is, well, which gamers? Which gamers get to decide what's part of the core ortho game and what's part of the meta game? Which gamers and which forums get precedence? Are we just going to divulge and in, devolve into some sort of fight between different forums over who gets uh, who gets to decide what's core and what's not? Can I trust that just because gamers are discussing a game that they actually know what is core and essential? That through their discussions they're going they're not going to include something that would traditionally be seen as meta. And as soon as they do, doesn't the meta then just become the core because the gamers decided it? It's not a really strong basis of making a decision. It certainly doesn't provide any way of truly evaluating the terms. In fact, this is another issue that we run into with these definitions, is that these definitions don't actually define anything. More or less, what they provide is an order of precedence. So the gamers decide what's core to the game. And what the, when the gamers interact outside of that core, that's what we call the meta. But that's not really clearly giving us anything to discern what is and what isn't. How I'm surely I'm going to interact with players around the game as well as in the game, but when am I hitting the meta and when am I not? With Garfield's definitions, we have clearly defined terms that clearly explain what is and is not an ortho game when we are and are not engaged in metagaming. With Carter, Gibbs and Harrop, it seems more like the definition is, well, black isn't white and white isn't black. What's an ortho game isn't metagame and metagame isn't ortho game. And that's not really a clear definition that allows for conversation and dialogue. It also leads to great ambiguity. Now, broadening terms is fine in an academic sense, and often we can get bogged down in terminology that hinder the discussion and the dialogue process. So these terms would be useful if that's what they were doing, except they're not. And even getting involved with the paragaming as a way of trying to somehow delineate metagaming, which is community-based, as opposed to metagaming, which is individual-based, surely there are easier ways to do it than using paragame, which... Again, just it's still part of the metagame, if it's, if it's clearly defined, perhaps. But to say that because I'm individually setting goals, I'm engaged in paragame as opposed to metagaming doesn't really seem to make it e any easier to define metagaming or orthogaming. And even now, I feel confused just using these terms. I don't feel like I'm able to describe or accurately depict anything. Now, Carter, Gibbs and Harrop, I think provide a really good sense that the definitions that we have may not be sufficient enough. And I like the idea that they're trying to bring in the community and they're trying to empower gamers to be part of defining the very hobby that they love. I just don't think it really becomes suitable for making better discussions. Perhaps what Carter, Gibbs and Harrop really bring to the fore is the fact that a lot of these investigation and analysis is coming from emic investigations into the culture. That means that these terms are being defined and our understanding shaped by investigations from people who are within the culture. So gamers evaluating and investigating gamers. Gamers defining what gaming is. And that's problematic in some sense. Now their response seems to be to elevate the position of gamers or of the public and their discussion into providing a greater sense of what it means to be gaming and yet I'm not sure that that is the appropriate response. Perhaps what we do need is some people from outside of the culture who are willing to value what we do and what we contribute and to provide insight from outside. In game design, I don't think we can't not think about the meta. It's the meta game that provides motivation for a lot of players, and I don't just mean Magic the Gathering, although that is a clearly good example to use. Magic the Gathering, which is all about the preparation, it's all about the communities of people that gather around it, it's all about the groups that form to try and get each other to the top, it's all about the prize money, it's all about the external rewards, it's about the articles online. It's a great example, and when you compare that to games like Tic-Tac-Toe, well, you can see how the meta drives and fuels the game. I don't recall anyone, and I mean anyone, in my school or in my social groups 
sitting there reminiscing about the time that played that tic-tac-toe and it was really tense and invested and they had that, you know, the X was right there and then they went with the, the O right in the center and it really confused them, they had to really think their way around it. It doesn't happen. But even in casual gaming, the meta game is an essential part of play. It's the stories we take hold of. It's the it's the discussions that happen afterwards. It's the time my friend was winning at Mission Red Planet, but failed to check the face down card in his sector, and that face down card caused him to go from first to third position. That's the meta game, and that's the that keeps the game alive. That keeps Mission Red Planet in the fore of my mind as a game I want to go back to because I want more of those stories. I want chances to to try my luck at this particular strategy again or give this a go next time. That's what keeps these games alive. But there are games that clearly even rest on the metagame as part of the gaming itself. I mean, think about tactical games where you're not expected to understand the fullness of the game in a first run through. It's the discussions and the strategizing and, and going in with a plan that makes that game part of what it is. It's essential to go in like that if you want to have any chance of doing well. It's the meta game, and it's why I'm even creating this video. This video is meta game. Articles, reviews, online forums are all part of the meta, and they're keeping the hobby alive. And it's essential that we consider those. How do we do it when designing a game? Well, some people are doing it in that they're. We're now creating legacy games where we're creating stories for people. We're giving people a reason to come back together and share a gaming experience. We're creating expansions and we're involving people in votes like they did with Smash Up, where the community voted on which characters they wanted to be in the next expansion. It's that and so much more. And I'm sure there's even some more creative ways in which we can involve the metagame into our gaming experience. Well, that's all I have on metagaming right now, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Perhaps you've got some great experiences with games that you want to share that are just great metagame experiences. I hope you've learned something from this. I hope you've enjoyed doing this tech talk with me. I certainly have enjoyed researching it. Until next time, I'm Dave Adams, and you've been watching The Core Mechanic. We'd love to hear from you. When has the metagame improved your gaming experience? Thanks for watching.